Greetings to all of you far and near. This brief service is coming to you again from First Lutheran Church in Windsor, Ontario. We welcome all of you who listen to God's word so that we might join together in worship, pray together, and call upon our Lord, thanking him for all the benefits that he has bestowed on us in our life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the entrance we hear from Psalm 55. I call to God, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Give ear to my prayer, O God and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power above all in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant us such a measure of your grace that we may obtain your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle for the tenth Sunday after Trinity is recorded in the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And the Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter. When Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. 
and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his word. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. From the gospel lesson that we heard just earlier these words, and when Jesus draw near and saw the city, he wept over it. Dear friends in Christ, this is quite a chapter that changes radically from one section to another. Immediately preceding the words that I just read, we hear of a wonderful event, event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and in most of our Bibles, the section is headed the triumphal entry. Jesus comes to the main city of the nation of Israel. A crowd gathers. They are waving palm branches and throwing clothes on the street. And they are shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Isn't that marvelous? Finally, no doubt, the, the uh, disciples 
of Jesus said, now we're going to get somewhere. We're going to arrive at what Jesus always wanted, to be recognized as the Messiah of God and then to accomplish the goals for which his heavenly Father sent him into this world. Jesus, welcomed by a large crowd in the main city where the holy temple of God is at home. And then the words that we heard as a gospel lesson on this occasion. And it begins with that rather disappointing verse, when Jesus saw the city, he wept. What's to weep about? Having just been welcomed like a hero, having walked, uh, walked into Jerusalem just like King David of old and being greeted as the King of Israel, the holy temple there, everything was functioning well. Religion was at the top of everything, was most important. Thousands came into the city to bring their sacrifices. The priests and the Levites kept being busy. Today we would say church was functioning doing what it was invented for, busy, busy in religion. And yet, again, Jesus saw the city and he wept. And I wonder, dear Christian friends, what it is that moved Jesus to tears, that made him cry. What is the cause of this sadness that overcame him? Certainly, his tears show his true humanity. Jesus looks at a city where apparently on the surface everything was all right. And yet he could see deeper. Not only the things were functioning on the top on the outside, but also what the heart of man looked like on the inside. And Jesus knew that's where the real problem arises. That's the predicament of man. Not primarily what he does, although that as well, but foremost of all, how he thinks and what his intentions are and the goals that he sets for himself. The tears that we see are really the tears of God. God himself is struck by the sadness caused by what you and I do, by how we live, how we speak and how we act. They are indeed an eloquent witness of the true humanity of Christ. But then, of course, we might be tempted to say, so what? What do they say to us? They are also a certain sign of the judgment to come. Jesus said as he saw this, apparently religious city and all that was going on there, would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace. And what would make for peace? Not our plans, not our intentions, not the, not the best that we have to offer, but what God calls us to do that he shows us his holy will in his Ten Commandments, for instance, that he calls on the nation of Israel to recognize the arrival of the one that all the prophets of the past had promised that he would come to redeem Israel and all the sinners in this world. And yet many said, no, 
we are going to rely on ourselves, we will do what we think is necessary. And therefore the tears of Jesus that he cries in the face of the religious city of Jerusalem is also an insistent call to contrition and repentance. God doesn't want us to stay the way we are. And it is one of those typical mistakes of modern theologians that they say, God always accepts you the way you are. No, he doesn't. God doesn't want you to stay the way you are. God wants to change you, not because you're able to do that, but because he himself sends his spirit to the preaching of the gospel and the serving of the holy sacraments that your life may be renewed and that your spirit may ask what God would have you do. That is called contrition. That is called repentance. To say no to the old way of living and to ask for God's power and spirit so that we may follow on his way. We're going to fail as we try to achieve that goal. We're always weak, not only in our tensions, but also in the way we act and live. And therefore, the fact that Jesus cries in the face of Jerusalem, that he expresses his sadness, this is at the same time a wonderful proof of his mercy and grace. Ah, he says, that you would know what serves for peace, your peace, your peace inside your heart, inside your thinking and doing, so that you look to God and to his Son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent into the world for you. God shows his mercy that way. God is a forgiving God to all those who repent, who confess, and who desire the new life to which God calls us. Here we have it, that Jesus himself comes and calls us back to his heavenly Father, his heavenly Father who is always ready to take us back even though we may have gone different ways and tried to achieve wrong goals. The question is, of course, Jesus is not like he did in those days, physically stand before ourselves and that we can see him cry, but we know what he did for us and why God sent him to be not only the Messiah of the nation of Israel, but to be our Redeemer for all the men, mankind here in this world. And so, Jesus entering the city and then, of course, going to the temple to cleanse it. He was teaching daily in the temple. He didn't want this just to be rote exercises, keeping doing what we've always done and not asking why we're doing it. The church is called always to preach the gospel, meaning that we first of all point to the will of God that he has expressed in the Ten Commandments and knowing that we so often fall short of fulfilling them, of doing what God's holy will prescribes, we proclaim the gospel. That's what the Christian church is called on to do to this very day. The gospel that says, what you failed to do, God sent his son to do in your stead. And the sin that you committed, he piled on Jesus, his son, so that you may always know that God is a righteous God who shows his righteousness not by condemning you, but by punishing his son on the cross and in his death. This is applied to you. In the preaching of the gospel, Jesus the Savior, 
This is what Jesus says and does in your behalf. This is what we distribute as we follow the command of Christ to administer the holy sacraments like the gospel of forgiveness, the baptism with water calling people to God and to be his children and to serve the body and blood of Christ in the holy sacrament of the altar so that we might be strengthened for the road that leads to eternity. And like Jesus used the donkey to enter into Jerusalem to be welcomed as the King of Israel, so today there are donkeys that are still bringing Jesus into the midst of people and their lives. The called ministers of Christ are the way that God himself through Jesus comes into our life through the proclamation of the gospel and the administration of the sacrament. Tears of God showing how much he loves us and how mid all the power at his command he fights for your and my salvation. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Grant that by the preaching of your gospel we may be given the wisdom that leads to salvation. By the working of your Holy Spirit keep us attentive to all the teachings of your word. Enlighten our minds, control our wills, purify our affections. Let your word be a light for our path, that neither the pleasures, nor the honors, nor the pains of this life may turn away our thoughts from the fullness of life that is found only in you. Enable us in sincerity of heart to follow you, the only true God. By your holy word, enlighten all who are in error doubt or temptation with the sure and certain knowledge of your truth that all who live in sin may be led to repentance. Show mercy and grace to all those suffering any distress, to those who are sick or hospitalized and to those facing death. Let them know the sure comfort of your holy word. We, we commit ourselves and all for whom we pray 
to your fatherly care. Be gracious to us and defend us by your power. Direct us by your spirit that we may daily grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior until we shall stand before you in the joy of everlasting glory. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us join in the prayer which our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.